And now... Super Magic Force Wars! Super Magic Force Wars! Fan Fiction Crossover Spectacular! From the quiet forests of Little Earth, to the sprawling cities of the wide world and beyond, to the planets of outer place, the multi-world is a battleground for the dual soul heroes. Each one a combination of two or more fandom favorites fighting to keep the seven stones of aggravation out of the hands of those who would destroy the easel of creativity itself. Written and performed by M.J. Maiello and based on the greatest works of our time. Chapter 1. Many Meetings One point one. The Arrival Setting Little Earth Samwise Gamgee tied back his long white hair and pressed forward. The Black Riders had ridden past, and he could only hope that the elf now bearing his master away would get him to safety. He had far outpaced his two hobbit companions as he raced to the top of the hill. There, the ranger that had been his guide faced the eastern sky. A long, weather-worn green cloak flowed in the breeze. Sam had reluctantly come to trust the ranger, and he had to admit that without guidance, his master would not have made it this far. He followed the ranger's gaze up into the sky where he saw something quite out of place. My stars and garters, Sam said, his mouth falling open. No one at home would ever believe me. I heard tell of such things, but I never thought they were real. What is it? he asked. But the ranger's head only shook, and no answer was given. It was, in fact, a blue Ford Anglia flying through the sky. Harry looked out the car's window to the expanse of green lands. I can't believe he actually expected us to travel here by foot. In the driver's seat was his best mate, Ron Weasley, a 12-year-old wizard fresh from his first year of Hogwarts, a year that had very much not gone according to plan. I know, Ron said, his speech slightly obscured by the licorice wand dangling from the corner of his mouth. I can't believe they expected us to travel the whole way here with that Russian half-giant. Indeed, the headmaster had given them a quest, and a great deal of supplies, and even a purse of coins to make the three-week journey south from Hogwarts. But they had spent the gold on chocolate frogs, fizzing whisbies, and ice cream from Florian Fortescue's while staying at the Leaky Cauldron in Diagon Alley. But with their money running out, and the date of the council approaching, they decided to travel to their destination at last. So they borrowed Mr. Weasley's enchanted car and began the flight to Little Earth. It had been a very pleasant journey, with Harry's mechanical owl Bobo Wig hooting, clicking, and chirping in the back seat all the way. That must be it, Ron said. Harry looked down to the splendor of the last homely home nestled into a hidden valley amid waterfalls and winding paths. Rivendell. One point two. A bumpy landing. Setting. The sky above Rivendell. What are those? Harry saw nine black-robed horsemen wading into the river below as a small figure crawled onto the far shore. It looks like a bunch of dementors on horses, Harry said. I think someone needs our help. Ron tried to circle back to get another look at the scene but the car only reluctantly complied. Then, Harry saw a young woman standing atop a rocky outcropping above the river. There was some kind of musical instrument strapped over her shoulder. Her brown hair swirled around her as she moved with a sinuous grace. With every movement of her hands, the river beneath her seemed to pile up as if readying itself for a great surge forward. What is that? Ron asked and Harry looked to see a black horse flying through the air like it had just been fired from a catapult. 
Then they were both screaming. A severed arm, wrapped in a black sleeve, landed on the windshield, its gauntleted hand clawing at the glass. Get it off! Get it off! Harry screamed. Ron fumbled with the controls, turning the headlights on and off before activating the wipers, which pushed the arm across the windshield and then dragged it back and forth in a mockery of a pleasant wave. Ron turned the car upside down, dislodging the arm, but losing control of the car in the process. Ron's screams sounded like a dying cat as Harry covered his ears to little effect and the whole car began to vibrate. The car spun around the valley, splashing through a waterfall and nearly knocking a spire off a small tower. Finally, it rumbled to a stop. Nice landing, Harry said. Thanks, Ron said, picking up the last bit of his licorice wand from where it had stuck to the windshield and putting it back in his mouth. What is the meaning of the two of you showing up in this manner? A familiar voice said through the pursed lips on her ageless face as she pulled her blue shawl tight over her shoulders. Standing before them was their Defense Against Irrationality teacher, Professor McGonagall. You've broken a hundred years of wizarding convention by bringing a piece of muggle technology to Little Earth. We were sent here to take part in the council, Harry said. Now that she mentioned it, he did remember learning something about the Little Earth conventions in his history of Little Earth class. But Professor, there was something happening at the river. All is under control, a voice as rich and smooth as polished mahogany said. They turned to see a dark-haired elf with a discerning gaze looking at them as he descended a flight of stairs wearing a beige turtleneck under his flowing robe. Welcome, my young friends, to Imladris the man said, with a sweep of his hand. Harry and Ron, McGonagall said, allow me to introduce the Lord of Rivendell, Carl Sagrand. One point three. A Gathering of Heroes Setting Little Earth Rivendell Carl Sagrand walked Harry and Ron around the very pleasant grounds of Rivendell. It was small compared to Hogwarts Castle, but the elves that graced its halls were much better looking than the scrawny, bat-eared house elves of Hogwarts. He brought them to a gathering in a comfortable parlor with a large fireplace. There, they were introduced to a proud, blue-eyed man with dark hair that was graying at his temples. His name was Lan El Cadvan de Aragorn. He shook their hands and looked into their eyes and said, Well met. He smelled like pine branches, and something about his gaze made them both feel like they should go chop some firewood and build a log cabin. You didn't hear from me, McGonagall whispered, but he's the secret heir to the throne of all Little Earth. They also met a very tall, muscular young man with bright red hair and an impressive beard. This, McGonagall said to them, is Randall Thor. Rand, this is Harry and Ron. Ron Weasley, Ron said, offering to shake the young man's hand. But looking at Rand, he could not help but think that Rand looked like he could have been a relative, even an older brother. Blood and ashes, Rand said. No wonder people keep telling me I look like a Weasley. Rand shook his hand reluctantly and stalked off. He could be heard to mutter, My father. Tam is my father. Oh well, he is a bit temperamental, McGonagall said to them. And this is Myrad of Pelinor. Pelinor was a sister school to Hogwarts, you know, specializing in bardic magic before it was tragically destroyed. It once competed with us in the Quad Wizard Cup. Harry turned to see the prettiest woman he had ever seen her long brown hair falling beside her porcelain face. She wore a sleeveless green dress and carried a lyre. He realized at once she was the one he had seen working some kind of spell on the river. You made the river get big, Harry said, his tongue not quite cooperating. Body move spell. Oh, my red blushed. Yes, just something I picked up on the way here. This place is amazing, isn't it? I've already taken three baths. Harry stood speechless, 
wanting very much to say something to her, but not finding any words that his mouth would be willing to form. He was, thankfully saved from this awkwardness by the sound of two motorcycles outside. Motorbikes? Here? McGonagall said. Who would have the audacity? She looked out the window and said, I should have known. Production Notes This is MJ Maiello, the creator of Super Magic Force Wars. So, if you've listened this far, you're probably asking, what the hell did I just listen to? Well, Super Magic Force Wars is essentially a podcast featuring a legal disclaimer with an associated work of fan fiction and parody. It is a rather absurd story in which many of the greatest characters and storylines from pop culture are woven together into one possibly comedic narrative. Every character in this story is or will become a dual character, combining the traits, attributes, and powers from two, or sometimes more, of some of the most popular characters from fantasy fiction and sci-fi with a few pop culture icons thrown in for good measure. The bar for inclusion is fairly high, although not every listener will know every character or get every reference. You should be able to recognize at least half of one character in every scene. To be included, Characters must appear in two or more forms of media, such as books, including comic books, television shows, or movies, with a handful of exceptions. For the most part, the intended audience is people who have some familiarity with the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, as well as Harry Potter, Star Wars, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and there will be many more references beyond those fandoms. What else can I tell you? This is a one-man show, for better or worse, mostly for worse, I will be performing everything, even though I have no acting ability to speak of and my diction is far from perfect. In case you're wondering, I have the remnants of a Staten Island, New York accent, and I have rather full lips. But if you stick this out with me, I guarantee it will at least occasionally be a source of entertainment and a celebration of all that is good in fandom culture. For more information about me, my writing, and Super Magic Force Wars in general, go to my website, mjmiello.com. That's spelled M-J-M-I-E-L-L-O.com. There you can sign up for my newsletter so you never miss a thing. And now, the part you have all surely been waiting for. General Disclaimer. This is a work of fan fiction, satire, admiration, and love. It is solely for entertainment. I do not own the rights to any of the reference works. This includes, but is not limited to, The Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Star Trek, The Hobbit, Marvel Comics, The Wheel of Time, The Pelennor series, Game of Thrones, any Disney properties, or Norse mythology. I do not own the rights to any characters portrayed in this series at all, not even a little bit. The creators of these intellectual properties have not endorsed this work, and they almost certainly would not return my phone calls. The Harry Potter series was created by J.K. Rowling and is owned by Warner Brothers. The works of J.R.R. Tolkien are owned by the Tolkien Estate. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, Marvel Enterprises, Star Wars, and the works of Disney Animation are owned by the Disney Company. The Pelennor series was created by Alison Croggan and published by Candlewick Press in the U.S. The Wheel of Time was created by Robert Jordan and is published by Tor Books in the U.S. Also note, Neil Gaiman, Hayao Miyazaki, George Lucas, Stan Lee, and Chris Claremont are just plain awesome. This podcast is and always will be available for free, and I am not and never will be making any profit from this podcast. All rights of the original intellectual properties belong to their respective owners. Please don't sue me. Prologue. In the beginning. The gods of order were locked in an endless war with the gods of chaos. Chaos inflicted change. An order sought restoration in pursuit of unchanging reality, ever constant and immobile. Chaos sought a reality that was ever in flux, where no constant held and nothing could exist for more than one instant. But then, Foresight, one of the gods of chaos, looked into the future and saw that in a world without any constancy, Chaos itself would be a constant. He saw not a thrilling world of excitement or pleasure, but a never-ending static of nothingness, 
Order and chaos in their extremes were one and the same. Foresight arranged for a meeting with Hindsight, one of the gods of order, and he shared his vision with her. Hindsight, too, saw the futility of the War of the Gods, but the two of them could not convince their cohorts. All further negotiation was forbidden. However, Foresight and Hindsight would not give up their new revelation, and they met in secret and became as one. From this union, a child was born, the child of order and chaos. And this child was the trickster, who in time forged the easel of creativity. Using the easel, this trickster gave rise to the sphere of cosmos, a swirling mass of potentiality contained in an orb. The gods of order and chaos alike were appalled at this creation. At once they agreed to work together to destroy it. But since the trickster was made of both order and chaos, his creation was immune to all the powers they had thus far known. So the gods of order and chaos came together to forge a great weapon, a new force that had never taken shape before. The weapon was the Shard of Time, and its forging was exactly what the trickster had wanted. When the Shard of Time struck the Sphere of Cosmos, it blew apart in an explosion of unparalleled catastrophe. The gods of order and chaos looked on, assured of their victory, as the material of the Sphere expanded outward in a violent, churning storm. But when the explosion slowed, they saw that it did not burn out, but it continued to exist. The universe was born. Through the influence of time, order had allowed substance to endure, at least for a span. Chaos had ensured that with time, all that was contained within the universe changed and nothing remained constant for long. With time, this swirling dance gave rise to life, and life gave rise to beings. From beyond the edge of reality, the gods of order and chaos looked on with disdain for what had been created against their will. And they vied ever to undo existence. And yet, their efforts are thwarted unto this day. For among the mortals there are those that can understand the mind of the trickster. These miraculous souls are called upon to create summoning into their mind the power of the easel of creativity so as to give rise to art. And it is the fear of the gods of order and chaos that as long as beings wield the power of creativity, the universe shall endure. Super Magic Force!